Because she already knows what I'm going to preach. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to talk to you Luke 19 today, and um, just it, this is a challenge to me. It, it's a it, there's kind of a twofold message here, and so so there's a first part and a second part. There's a part to those who have a need today, and then there's those of us who have had our needs touched by the Lord. There's those there's some who come to church that that need a touch from Jesus. There's others who come to church that need to be the touch of Jesus. To others, and so, and you can't always be needy. Okay, we we've talked about this, but the whole religious world will constantly make you needy. You'll never measure up, and you'll always fall short. So you'll need another training, another teaching, another something before you're good enough to share your faith, to give, to do. And the problem is, you never get there. So. Uh, I have a friend that he, he led his first person to the Lord 15 minutes after he got saved. He didn't know any better. He didn't know he was supposed to be trained. <laughs> he, didn't know, he didn't know any better. He just, he just was, he got touched by the Lord at the park and he went and found his friend and said, you got to come. Man, I found something that's so cool. And he led his friend to the Lord. And it was like, and, and, and that's the way we ought to be. We, we ought to see ourselves as, it, it's not a, it, it's the old, it's John 9. It's the blind man born blind. I love him. I love that story. This has nothing to do with my message, but it's a great story because he says, he says, um, I don't know anything. He goes, I don't know whether this guy's a sinner or not. We're talking about Jesus. He goes, I don't know any of your theology. I don't know anything. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. All I know is that I was, and now I'm this, and, and that's all I know, and do you want that too? And it's that simple. And so um, I think that I think we, we've, got to, we've got to have an understanding of that, and there's an aspect of this in this message today. Um, Luke 19 is, is a story, the, the first... I want to, I'm going to do... Um, we're actually going to go to verse, we're going to do 27 verses. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read them all to you, uh, but we're going, to do, we're going to talk about this story here, the 27 verse, verse 27 verses of Luke 19. Um, Jesus, Jesus just got done touching a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus, and um, as he was going into, Jer- into Jericho in the previous chapter, and now he's been in Jericho, and now he's on his way out of Jericho, and he runs in, as he's in Jericho, as he's getting ready to leave, there's a guy there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, when I was a kid, we sang this little song, Zacchaeus was, a wee little man was he, right? He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Okay, so this is Zacchaeus we're going to talk about. Zacchaeus' name actually means pure, pure. Pure. But the problem is, is Zacchaeus in our text was a tax collector. Boo. He wasn't just a a tax collector. He was the chief of tax collectors. So he was the supervisor, the regional tax collector, the director of the region of tax collectors. Which, which in our day, I mean, there are taxes, we understand that, and when you, if you ever travel overseas and you go to certain places, you always come back. I've gone to Haiti and various other places where the infrastructure is so shot that when you come back into U.S., you want to just say, thank you for taxes, for about three minutes. <laughs> so, so, so there's nothing wrong with the taxes or anything, but the tax collectors of the day were, were, let me explain to you a little bit about them, okay? They're called, some of the translations call them publicans or tax collectors. And what they were is they were sellouts to Rome. They were Jewish people that sold themselves over to Rome. And you see, Rome occupied um, Israel. In case you want to know how Rome got occupied Israel, I just, just to tell you, I, this is a side note. How did Rome, does anybody know how Rome ever came to occupy the nation Israel at the time of Jesus? You know how it happened? They were, in, they were invited by the priests. Hundreds of years prior, they were invited because they wanted protection. 
And they couldn't trust God, so they asked Rome to protect them. And when they opened the door to something other than Yahweh's protection, it became controlling and dominant in their life. And so the people were taxed heavily. But they weren't just taxed heavily. The Romans would find these Jewish citizens who were who would be sellouts to the sense because the, the Israelites, the Jews hated the Romans because they oppressed them. So you had this you had this oppression, these people that were under servitude, they were paying heavy taxes, they were under dominance of Rome, and you had this Roman dominance, this military might that was just oppressing the people, and in between there, there were these people that collected the taxes. They took the taxes of the Jews, and then they gave them to Rome. But they also found out that in their system that if they could, if they could take the taxes and, and give a, collect a little more, so say, you owe, Lisa owes me $100 in taxes, and, but I can get from her $150 in taxes, then I give the $100 to Rome and I keep the 50 So the Roman tax collectors started, they became corrupt and they started overtaxing the people, and they started, so not only did they represent Rome, but they overtaxed the people and kept them in oppression. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to teach that if you were a publican or a tax collector, a sellout, that you could not go to heaven. You were not a people of the kingdom. You were cut off from your family. You were no longer sons of Abraham. You were no longer children of, of Abraham. You were cut off from, from your family line. You were, you, were, you were disavowed your position in Israel. And when you died, you took a toboggan slide straight to hell. That's the way, that, that's the way they were taught. So this is what they're, they're dealing with culturally. So you got this guy named Zacchaeus. It isn't just this little cute story that he climbs up in a tree. you got this guy named Zacchaeus who is the chief of tax collectors. He's the supervisor. He is the regional director for the Jericho region of tax collecting. And he is the guy. And it says not only was he a tax collector, not only was he chief tax collector, he was very wealthy. How did he get wealthy? On all the, all the oppression that was on the nation Israel. He got wealthy from it. He was just pushed up. As the more and more taxes were collected, he just went up. Okay, his pyramid scheme. His pyramid, he was going up and up. He's doing commercials, doing everything, doing great. <laughs> Join my thing, little Facebook ad, do this, click here. You too, I got rich in three minutes. You've seen those ads. First month, I made $2,000. Second month, 400000 Click right here and find out how. <laughs> you click right there and they're going to make $420,000. Some of it's going to be off of you. And so, so this, is, this is Zacchaeus, okay? He's hated by all the people. And so he hears Jesus is coming in the region. So Jesus is coming in the region. He's coming through. And so Zacchaeus wants to see him. The problem is, the scripture tells us that not only was he a tax collector, not only was he a social outcast, not only did people hate him, not only did he have no say in, in Judaism, so they weren't going to give him position, he was short in stature. He was a wee little man, whatever that means. <laughs> he was a short guy, so he wasn't tall. So you can read in between the lines. Why did he, the position, the place he had, maybe he was put down all his life. Maybe he was ignored all his life. Maybe he, maybe he, uh, maybe as a child he was laughed at for his size. I don't know if, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're younger in our day today and you're, you're more of the younger generation, he, uh, there's a lot of mental health issues and things that we're, we're aware of now that my generation didn't really talk about so much, even though we have issues and stuff. I mean, here, here's a guy who's been rejected and outcast. And so what does he do? He makes up for his short stature by gaining his position with Rome and being pushed up. And so now he's a wealthy short man. And might flaunt his money. I don't know. 
but he cannot, he wants to see. So this is where our story picks up. And so it says here, verse 3, Luke 19, 3. He wanted to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. That's what the song says. I don't know if the song came first or the scripture. (laughs) He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I did the motions, right? Okay. This is the point. And I'm going to make a couple points about if you're here with need. You're here with need. Zacchaeus was a needy man. He had everything externally going for him, but yet there was a void, there was something in his heart, there was the emptiness of not connecting with God. He was raised in a religious system that rejected him. He rejected the system. He went in another way. Whatever the disconnect was, but he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted the real deal. And what did he have to do? He climbed up in the tree. So this is what you have to do. You want an encounter with God? Position yourself for an encounter with God. Put yourself in a position for God, for Jesus to pass by you. Put yourself in that position. Don't buy into the lie. Zacchaeus did not stay home that day. He put himself in position. He saw himself as, I'm too short. I can't see. Is he over there? Wait a minute. He climbs up in the tree. He gets himself in a spot where he can see Jesus. He didn't know that he was also positioning himself to be seen by Jesus. He didn't just, he positioned himself for the encounter. I know a lot of people, they whine and moan and complain and they tell me all about their hurts and sorrows and needs and oh, it's so difficult and life is so hard and they do nothing at all to position themselves for an encounter with God. They want someone else to do that for them. No one is going to position you for your encounter with God. You have to position yourself. I'm not telling you you have to work at it. I'm not telling you you come by works. I'm not telling you in any way that it's all grace. It's all grace. And I I will say, it is completely grace. Know that. But know this, that if you just sit at home and whine all the time, nothing's going to happen. You have to position yourself. When Angel and I first started in our relationship, not with each other, and our, our, our pursuit of God at a deeper level, as we're married, as we started pursuing, and we wanted revival, we wanted a move of God, we wanted to go deeper, we didn't just sit at home and go, oh man, it'd be really nice. We went to wherever we heard. If we heard there was a flame, we were there. We did whatever it took. I'm not telling you to go and run to every conference and all those things either. I think, I think some of that gets absolutely ridiculous. We, we have people that go to conferences and then they get touched at that conference and they don't do anything with it and then they go to the next conference and don't do anything with that and they do that their whole life. No, but we were hungry. When Brownsville Revival was broken out, Angel said to me, our anniversary, anniversary weekend. She goes, I want you to take me away from my anniversary. Does she want to go on a cruise? Yes. Did she want to go somewhere else? Yes, but where did she choose? We, I want you to take me to Brownsville. The week of our anniversary, we spent standing in line for seven hours to get into church services. Brownsville, and during the revival in 1996, we lined up there. But that was because we, she said, we've got to go. You've got to go where the flame is. You got to position yourself. You have to position yourself in front. You have to come. You have to make do. Show up. If you're hungry for God, you need a healing from the Lord. Don't just sit there and expect someone to wander by. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm. I'm glad there's a water. Just a second. Uh, I've been fighting that that little thing right there. That flapper.
Take the wrapper off. It wasn't that long ago I took one of those, those ones that are double wrapped and I put it in my mouth while I was preaching and the paper was still on it. And then I was sucking it and while I'm doing it, my mind's thinking, this isn't working. So then I had to work the paper off with my tongue and take it out. So single wrap. Thank you. You can't just sit in the back of church and just go, when there's an altar, come. What I see, what I love about young believers is they don't care. You can get up and go, Genesis 1-1, come to the altar. They run down there. What are we here for? I don't know. I just want to touch from God. I don't care. It's better than what I had in the world. And it's better than the drugs I had. And it's better than this. I want to touch from God. So we come. We run down here. But as we get more mature, all of a sudden, we can't respond as much anymore. All of a sudden, we don't have to be down there because God knows where I am. I can get just as much here. I I know. I know you. I can tell you're really flowing, overflowing. It's powerful. It's, it's, I'm not telling you it's by your works, but there's something in the heart of response, responding, positioning yourself. Zacchaeus positioned himself. Point made, don't have to go on anymore. <laughs> Secondly, it says Jesus reached the spot, verse 5. Man, now this cough drop is like over, overworking. Jesus reached the spot. He took, looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. With what I told you, think about how counterculture that was. Think about what Jesus was doing. Think about the times you thought, does he really care about me? Think about, would he come to me? He went to the one that the Pharisees said were going straight to hell. My question is, how does he know his name? That wasn't in the song. It didn't say Jesus asked how to know his name. He just said, Zacchaeus, come down doesn't tell us if he inquired of it, doesn't know if he, it's a word of knowledge, we don't know, but he calls him. I got to go to your house today. Second point, so he came down at once and gladly welcomed him. He gladly welcomed him. You can position yourself for a move of God. You can do that. You could still miss the move of God because when he calls you, when he speaks to you, when he sends a vessel to minister to you, you can take away the gladly welcome part because it wasn't what you expected. I expected God to do this. The Naaman syndrome. I thought the man of God would come out and wave his hand and speak some great words over me. But he's sending me to wash in the Jordan. It's not looking like I expected it to look. But he gladly welcomed Jesus. He didn't come down and go, you can't come to my house. It's not prepared. I'm not ready. Jesus said, come into your house. He said he gladly welcomed him. If Jesus came to your house, do you gladly welcome him? If he knocks on your door, when he's come to heal you, when he's come to minister to you, is there a gladness in welcoming him? Or is there a hesitation because you still want to hold the reins of control over the situation? See, because I've been around the church a long time. A lot of people's prayer life, all it really is, is giving God advice. We tell God the problem, and then we tell God how to fix it. 
and then we give him the time frame. Zacchaeus wasn't just up in the sycamore tree. He didn't just climb down. He climbed down. This is what I want you to see. He climbed down with empty hands. He didn't have an agenda. He came this way. No agenda. No agenda. So many people that come to God with an agenda. These days, if we come with no agenda, He'll use us. He'll flow through us. He'll touch us. He'll exceed our expectations. But you can't come. Don't, don't come to God with the, with, the, um, with the tags on there like, um, uh, Lord, if you do this, then I will. I was telling the kids, I, I've told the story before, but the reason I'm in the ministry is because I did that when I was seven years old. I, I beat this kid. Well, I did something I shouldn't do. And then I didn't want to get in trouble. So I told God, if I don't get in trouble, I'll serve you. I remember that seven years old. I didn't get in trouble and here I am. Sometimes I think it would be a lot easier to get in trouble back then. So, he positioned himself for an encounter. He welcomed him gladly. And then he says this, verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. There's, there's two words that we don't like in Christendom that Zacchaeus did. The third thing. He repented and he made restitution. Those are two words that we don't like anymore in the church. He repented if I cheated anybody out of, uh, look, here I am, I'll give half my possession for, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. And he made restitution. Now, we, we don't mind re repentance because what we've done is, though, we've taken repentance and we've overlaid it with the definition of confession. So most of us think that repentance is just confession. <laughs> confession agrees with God. I've sinned. Confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, cleanse you all in righteousness. I confess, I messed up. But repentance takes it further. Repentance says, not only did I mess up, but my messing up was wrong, and I need to change my approach so that I don't keep doing it again. I'm going to change what I've done, I'm going to change the way I think towards this situation, and then that thinking is going to change my behavior. You change, repentance is changing the way you think, which affects your behavior. So my changing my, I think, I think different towards my sin, towards myself, towards what I'm doing, whatever it may be, my, the self-wound, the self-affliction it comes, the bondage it brings, the people that are hurt by my actions, various stuff like that. I confess I did wrong, but I'm changing my whole view towards it, and I'm also changing how I do. Lord, give me repentance so that I no longer keep doing the things I'm doing. I'm going to change. Repentance doesn't have to necessarily be that you, you can cry and boo-hoo and confess and weep, and sometimes we need to, but other times it's just, a, it's just a mental note. I'm changing. I won't do that again. Okay, guys, you with me? How many here, guys? How many guys? You've done something, right? You like you stuck your hand in a place you shouldn't. You touched something you shouldn't. The motor was running and you stuck your hand in there thinking you can just touch that little thing. And boy, and that, that belt and the fan was there and everything else that was spinning. All that noise was coming from something. And you found out the hard way. You went, Veed, and you were like, oh, never do that again. <laughs> touch those two wires. I won't do that again. Oh, honey, it's okay. I got this. I can stand on the top end of the ladder. Won't do that again. 
Oh, it's no problem. I can reach that spot over there from the ladder next to the roof here. Watch, I can get, I can. Never do that again. Right? Acts of repentance. Learn the hard way. Life is a constant place of repenting. If you don't learn, first time you do it, it's a mistake. Second time you do it, there's a J word for that. It's called jerk. <laughs> Come on, right? So, so we learn. So he repented. He said, listen, if I've cheated, I've done. I've been a tax collector. I've done this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give away half myself to the poor. But he also makes restitution. Restitution is the hard one. Restitution is, I cheated you, and now I'm going to pay you back. Restitution is going back. I have a, a friend that, that, that hurt someone really deeply years before, and then they got saved, and now it's 20-some years later, and um, they, they suddenly, they were in service, and the Lord dealt with them and said, you, you got to, I don't know, we were talking about whatever, and they said, you, with this type of subject, said, you got to go back and deal with that. And so he actually searched out, this teacher, I believe it was a teacher, searched out this teacher and went back and found this person on the internet thing and wrote an email and said, I just want to, I was your student 20 years ago, da, 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 and I did this and I did these things here, and I just want to ask your forgiveness. Something so simple, so liberating, so changing. Leonard Ravenhill told the story of when he gave his life to the Lord, God started dealing with him about restitution. Ravenhill said, and he lived in England, and he had, he had uh, stolen some things from the little local store. So he, he went down to the store, and he got on his bike, and he took some money from what he had stolen. And he took some money, and he went in, and he was trembling in fear. And he went into this little store owner and he went in there and the man said, what do you want? And he's just a teenage boy, young boy. What do you want? Because he was like, you know, in trouble. And he said, I, I gave my life to Jesus and he's changed me. And months ago, I took some things from the store and I'm back here to ask you to forgive me and to pay for those things. And he put the money on the table. This hard store owner with tears running down his face said, young man, I don't know what you have, but don't ever lose it. Restitution. Restitution. It changes us. It changes the people. Some of you here need to position yourself for that touch of Jesus. Some of you need to welcome him. Some of us need the acts of repentance and restitution in our life. Some of us need. Holy Spirit speaking to some of us right now. I just encourage you, listen to what he says. The story doesn't stop there. This is what blew my mind now. I'm going to shift into the mind-blowing part for me and the challenge that I feel. For those of us who aren't the needy ones, we're the ones whose needs have been met. Jesus says in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. What do you call him? Wait a minute. What did the Pharisees say about? What did the Pharisees say about tax collectors? They're no longer sons of Abraham. They will go straight to hell. Jesus looks and says, This man too is a son of Abraham. Wow. And then Jesus gives us these words. They're famous. Some of us have this on posters and all kinds of things. Verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is where this whole story started with me. I was reading John 3, 16, and I was thinking, for God so loved the world that he gave. He loved the whole world. Then I got started thinking about the guy who found the treasure in the field. You know that parable? Man finds the treasure in the field. Why didn't he just take the treasure? If he finds the treasure in the field, I'm in a field and I find a bag of gold. 
I pick the bag of gold, and I go home. But Jesus said, the man went off, he hid it again, and bought the whole field. Scriptures tell us God so loved the whole world. He bought the whole field for the treasure. He loves the whole world. He loves the whole world. We love what we have here. He loves the whole world. For every one of us who sit here, there's hundreds that aren't here. For every one who's sitting in church this morning across this city, there's hundreds and thousands that aren't here. He loves them all. I know we don't like to hear that. We want warm fuzzies. We want a thing, especially on a cold day like this, you just want a nice warm cup of coffee. But I got up this morning, we came here to church, and, and I knew there was a guy sitting right outside the door out here with a bike. We get homeless guys, and there was a homeless guy right here. And so I, I, told, I told someone, I said, I'm going to wait till Megan gets here to deal with it, because I know when Megan walks out there, I, I, and five minutes later, no more than five minutes later, because Megan deals with the children here, and so this is the children's area, so I knew five minutes later, Megan comes walking in her eyes with this big, like, what are you going to do? And I go, she goes, it wouldn't be a big deal, but he has a big old machete oh, no. in his bike. He had a big machete in his bike, okay. Okay. So I knew. So, so anyway, so the Lord, I was like, Lord, what do I do? And I went, I went in the office, I made this cup of coffee. Made this cup of coffee. And I went out, and I opened the door. He was leaning against the door, and I opened the door a little bit. And I said, and he goes, he goes oh, no, no, I'm, I'll go, I'll go. And I said, no, 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 don't go, don't worry. It's okay. It's all good. And he's shivering, just shivering, so cold. I said, I made you a cup of coffee. And he got up, and he said, I'm sorry, I was so cold. I couldn't make it all the way where I wanted to go last night. I was so cold, and he's just shivering under his, he's got his stuff on, he's just shivering. I gave him, I said, I made you this coffee here. He said, thank you. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is, um, I know, my brain just went, Jared. Um, Gerald, Gerald. He goes, my name's Gerald. And then he says this, I had an encounter with God in this church when I was 14 years old. The Lord spoke to me and said, you're calling in the prodigals. Are you ready? <laughs> last week, last week in service, we called the prodigals home. Why was he here? Because he had an encounter with God here. Gave him his coffee. He's just shivering. He said, I'll get out. I said, no, no. I said, we got kids coming here. And you know, I, 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 these guys, I love to talk to some of them. They're just, we, we, get, we get so quickly where we want to just shoo everybody away and get out of here, whatever. And I just, they're just people. I said, it's okay. I said, we got some kids coming a little bit. He goes, I know. I got to get going. I'm going to go to wherever. And he's going to go. And I said, can I pray for you? He said, please. And he grabbed my hand and held it to his chest. I prayed over him. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. I could go into it. I got all these words all down, all the Greek. Seek, save the lost. You know the word save is the word sozo here. We always talk about it, but sozo means to rescue, to cure, to heal. Did you know that before the Catholic Church took over the world? I'm just being blunt. I'm just sorry. But I'm on a blunt day today. Just, I don't know what it is. Just kind of... Catholicism in A.D. 300, came in, took over the world, and everything shifted. Up until 300 A.D., the early church fathers taught salvation and looked at sin as something they needed to be healed from.
that healing, wholeness on the inside would bring healing to the outward actions. That when a person was made whole on the inside, they no longer had to do the stuff outwardly that they were controlling them. That the way to break through was to be cured inwardly so the outside actions would just, they would just basically, with the heart change, you would, everything would just start to lop off. So we have this word, sozo, salvation, I've come, salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save, I've come to bring salvation, sozo, deliverance, healing, I've come to cure, that's right baby, the lost, I've come to cure the lost. The word lost here, the Greek means this, basically, those given over to ruin. The idea is that there's people on a path that's leading to death and destruction. I've come to take them off. I came, I found Zacchaeus up in a tree, and I want you all to know that my purpose of coming, I came to the earth to take people that the world has written off as incurable, that are supposed to be on the toboggan slide to hell, I've come to show you that I've come to redeem them and cure them and take them off the path of destruction and bring life to them. But then something jumped out at me. Yeah. Something jumped out at me. It's the next verse. Because my Bible has this this little thing in it. What do they call those? Headings? And it says, the parable of the ten minas. And so, in my mind, it cuts that off from that story. Because they put this heading there. But look at verse 11. Put verse 11 up there. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. While they were what? To what? To what's this? They're listening to him talk about Zacchaeus and that he came to save the lost. So he went on to tell them this parable. So the parable was directly related to Jesus coming to save the lost. And what he modeled in Zacchaeus. Are you with me? I mean, just, and when I saw this, I said, oh, this is like, this is too convicting. So I closed my Bible, and I just closed service and said, let's go to Denny's. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. In verse 12, he tells a parable. I, I won't read it, this part, okay? But it says, a man, he says, a man of noble birth went to be made king, and he leaves three servants, ten minas. He gives them money and says, here, and look what he says to them, right? So he called ten servants, verse 13, and gave them ten minas, which is about three months' wages, okay? About three months of pay. And he said, put this money to work until I come back. And then we know the rest of the story, right? He goes, he gets made king, he comes back, and he calls the first one in and said, what you do with my money? And he said, I invested it. And look, I got 10 more, right? I think that's... Uh, that's right here. Um, verse 16, the first one came and said, Sir, your Marna has earned 10 more. Verse 17, well done, my good and faithful servant, the master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. The second came and said, Sir, your Marna has earned five more. 
The master answered, you take charge of five cities. Verse 20, then another servant came and said, sir, here's your mina. I've kept it laid away in a place, a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out where you don't put in and where you reap where you don't sow. The master replied, I'll judge you by your very own words, you wicked servant. You knew, you knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I didn't, I I did not put in, or a, a reaping where I did not sow. Then why didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have at least collected the interest? He says, take the mine away from man, this man, and cast this man away from me. Okay. I said, Lord, what does this mean? And Lord said this. I've entrusted my people with gifts. I've entrusted, I've entrusted each of us. I have come and called you. I have come and changed you. And I've entrusted you. We're the healed ones. We're the ones that, we're not the needy ones that have to come and position ourselves. We've already positioned ourselves. We've already been touched by Jesus. We're already did. We've received a portion, a mina. We've received something from the Lord. And he said, what are you doing with that? What are you going to do with that? What are you doing with that? What are we doing that individually? Are we willing to invest and spend what he has blessed us with? Or do we just hide it? And we know the story. But I started thinking, what have we been invested with? We've been invested with presence. We've been invested. We as a church have been invested with supernatural healings. We've been invested with the presence of the Lord. Incredible worship time. Incredible time of the Lord's presence. We've been invested with so many things that he's given to us. And he says, I've given you a portion just like I've given the portions to the churches in our city, our community, and the world. And those are not supposed to be kept in the walls of the church but I need you to take them and invest them into the world around us. Look at your neighbors. Look at your friends. Look at the people around you. Look at the guy on the treadmill next to you at the gym. Look at the people around you. It's more than just being a little smile and go, hey, God bless you, and just walking on. See yourself as one who has something that they need, and don't be afraid to spend it. The only one who got rebuked was the one who was afraid. They were afraid that God would rebuke them for taking what they had. Because they were afraid to invest it. They were afraid to take it outside. So Jesus said this, I just modeled you something, guys. I modeled you why I came. I showed you how, like, it was a setup. Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree. This was a setup by the Father to show us his heart for the lowest of the low. Nobody in Israel would have thought that that man would even get the attention of Abba. And yet he said, I came, Abba sent me. You're afraid that he's a hard man. And you're afraid to take what I've given you, Israel, and give it to the world around you. So you made 660-some laws to protect the mina I've given you. And then you use those laws to condemn the very one that I have come to save. It's the same way in the church. We we get blessed. You know what? When God heals you, it's wonderful, but it's not for you. It's for everyone else to know you're healed. And when you don't testify, when you don't testify and talk about the healing power of Jesus and that you know you're healed, if you don't, there's a a shirt that I saw advertised. Um, uh, um, 
Maybe, maybe uh, Yvonne's watching. She's got these shirts that she's made, and it just said, I've been healed from. And then they, they make, they custom made whatever you're healed from. I've been healed from cancer. I've been healed from, from, uh, from uh, whatever it may be. I've been healed from kidney disease. I've been healed from knee pain, I, whatever. And you just wear it. It's a conversational starter. But when we hold back and we don't testify, when we don't stand up and say Jesus can change the situation, when we don't stand up with our homes and our families and, and do that, we're sitting back on that mina and we're burying it. We have it all wrapped in neat and we keep it and said, I know it's hard and, 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 I, I'm gonna, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some, some rules in my life so that I can keep this feeling. And eventually those rules become what we know as of religion. And those rules eventually cause us to condemn the very ones that he wants to reach out to. This year, I believe God's saying to us at Hope, there's a shift, we're in a time of shifting. We have seasons and moves. We've been experiencing presence, it's wonderful. We've been experiencing healings, it's wonderful. We've been experiencing the presence of God. But God is saying that this is not just for us to come and just to hide on Sunday morning and come in in the four walls of the church and go, oh, it's so wonderful. What a great place of peace it is. Thank God for that. What a great place of rest it is. What a great place to raise our families in this environment. It is. And all those things. We're never going to lose that. But we have to be thinking, how can we take what he's given to us and invest it in the Zacchaeuses? Because there's a Zacchaeus down the road needing the Jesus that's in you. There's a Zacchaeus waiting. There's someone who's been written off. It's a young man sleeping at the door. There's a drug addict. There's an alcoholic. There's a lost son or daughter that's lost their way in identity. They don't know if they're a boy or girl or an it or whatever. Instead of we, the church, it's so easy. Because to me, I think that's almost ridiculous. Like... So it's so easy to write that off and say. And yet for them, it's very real. What's the Zacchaeus that we've written off? Who are we afraid to give away to because we're afraid, well, is God really in this? Oh, I hope he's with it. Oh, he's hard. I hope I don't give this away because if I do, he's, he might not. The first two with the minas, they didn't even think about it. They just invested God gave the, it was a return. There's going to be a return. All he's looking for is us to love them, care for them. This year, we're going to talk more about this. This is a year where I believe God is shifting our thinking, that we have a whole lot that God has done for us, but there's a world out here that is desperately in need of it. So there's a twofold thing here today. Maybe you came today and you have a need. Maybe you have a need. Jesus has come to seek and save you. He's come to deliver you. He's come. Maybe you need a healing and a touch from the Lord. And maybe you need, maybe you need deliverance. Maybe you need, a, maybe you need a breakthrough in your life. Maybe you're just under it. Maybe it's depression or fear or anxiety. Maybe it's internal. Maybe it's external. Maybe you just need a friend and you feel lonely or whatever. Know this. He's come to seek and save you who are lost. He wants to touch you. He wants to minister to you. He's po you position yourself. Receive Take him joyfully. Open your hands up and gladly take him in. And then let do what he says to do. Change your thinking and change your behaviors. Do the things that bring restitution and healing in your life. And God will set you free. He wants to do that. And maybe you're here today. God wants to touch you. Amen, he wants to touch you. And I know there's one or two here that you're in that position. And, and God wants to minister to you. And there's many of us, though, that have been touched by the Lord. We've been healed. We've heard the gospel so many times that we could, we could quote it in our sleep. 
We know the scriptures. We know the four spiritual laws. We can turn people there. We know all the answers. We know all these things. And yet life is so busy. We're so this and that. And so many things and everything that we're walking right past the sycamore trees that the Zacchaeuses are waiting for. I believe there's a world. I believe that God wants to touch them. I believe that. And I believe God wants to use us. I don't believe God has given us a mina here, a blessed us with so much presence so that we could just hoard it and keep it in a cloth. We just need to say yes to him, whatever that takes. So right now, worship team, come quickly. If you have, if you're in need right now, you say, you know what? I, I need that touch from the Lord. I came, I, I do. I need, I'm, I'm a Zacchaeus right now. I, I'm, I'm going to position myself for a touch from God. If that's you. If that's you, I, I don't know, just real quickly, just step out of your seat and just come stand right here. Just come position yourself for that touch. Come and position yourself. Say, I need that touch from the Lord. I'm going to put myself in a position. Just come, open hands, and just say, I'm going to come position myself for that touch. Just come and stand. Come and stand. We're going to have ministry teams going to come pray with you. Praise God. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in that. I, we're here. We're here to get that touch from the Lord. We need that touch. The Lord is here. The Lord is here to touch our Zacchaeuses. There's victory. There's healing. There's life. There's restoration for you. There's hope for you. I'd like the uh, ministry team, please, quickly come. Someone stand with each one that's here. And if we don't have enough, make some. We'll grab some other people. Come on, let's get with everybody. There we go. Let's just get someone here. Thank you, Lord. They're going to ask you what you're here for. They're going to pray with you specifically. We're going to pray. Specific healing, specific touch. If you're not down here, I want you, the second thing is that you would say, dear Lord, please give me the heart. Give me the heart to invest my mina, whatever that looks like, whatever that looks like. As, we, as the worship team plays here in a second, that's the spot. We're just agreeing. We're agreeing. We're agreeing right now that God's going to put the burden of his heart for the world around us on our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Whatever that need is, Lord, thank you. All over this building, you are. You're the God who meets us. You came to seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. Came and seek and save us out of our pain, out of, our, out of the junk that's in us, God. Healing and life. We're speaking healing and life. We're speaking healing and life. Ooh, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Healing and life, healing and life. Let it be released in this house. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. All over this building, all over this building all over this building. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that your heart, your heart, your heart for the, the Geralds, Lord God, would fall on us. Your heart for Zacchaeus. That we wouldn't write off the world around us. That we would love them where they are. You got you resurrected in us, Lord, so that Lord God, that so that Lord you would seek and save the lost through us. Do that in my heart, Lord. Do that in this house, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.